We're reading from 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. And for those of you who know, it's the story about Elijah having defeated um, the prophets of Baal. And it reads as such, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. And so Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again, seven times. He didn't say to him, Go seven times. He told him to go seven separate times to go and see it. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now this morning I want to speak to us in, in a sense about, is, <clears throat> do we really believe that God is going to show up? And do we have the spiritual eyes to see what others don't see? Because God used Elijah to, and to address a certain evil that had crept into the worship and the people of Israel. And we understand that this is the northern kingdom. And Ahab is king and his father was Omri. And what we understand from the Bible is that Ahab up until that time was the most wicked and evil king that Israel had ever seen. And so God uses this prophet Elijah to address this evil that has crept into the lives of his people. Because Ahab introduced Baal worship. Along with his wife. And put up temples and altars and poles, Asherah poles, uh, for the worship of these gods. And if we understand... The point of this is that Baal was the god of fire, he was the god of rain, fertility. Uh, I mean, he was god to these people. And understand the story behind this. What, what God is doing is, in a, is addressing an evil and asking people to repent. He's saying to the people, through his prophet, through the spokesperson whom he has chosen, and he's saying to them, You've become an evil people in my sight. And I'm giving you an opportunity to repent. And I'm sending you my word. And I'm sending you my spokesperson. Who speaks on my behalf. Because I want to address this issue in your lives. And that's not what I want to address in your lives this morning. Maybe the Lord does. And maybe he'll use certain words and phrases this morning to speak to you. But... That's what the Lord is speaking to you about personally this morning. The message that he has given me is for his people. How are we addressing what the world is going through? How are you and I hearing what God has to say to us and being the spokespeople for what people cannot see that God's people should be seeing? And in addressing this, what God does is He challenges the authority of the God whom the people have chosen to worship. So the very first thing that God does is He sends Elijah to tell Ahab there will be no rain for a number of years. You see, what He's challenging is because remember, Fertility is not only fertility of human beings, but the seed of the ground as well. And so every seed that would be planted would be planted in fertile soil and it would sprout forth something that would bring fruit into the lives of people. 
And what Ahab was being told is that my God is saying to you that your God will no longer produce the food that you need. That Elijah's God will reign supreme over this God that they have elected to take into their lives. And Ahab is being told that your God has no power because it is the God of heaven and earth who holds all authority. And when he speaks, the earth produces. And when he speaks, rain falls on the earth. So whenever God speaks, whatever he says, produces forth what he has spoken. And so we find, and guess what? God takes, so once Elijah has uh, issued God's proclamation, God's word, and he said, this is it, God removes him from the scene. And so we have a a passage in, in chapter 17, and we find that, What happens is that uh, God takes Elijah, and from what I understand, what I can see, he prepares him for what is to come. There's a time in our lives that God removes us for preparation. And I'm not saying he removes you from life, because we do that ourselves, don't we? We are quite quite capable of taking ourselves away from the presence and the place that God wants us to be. And many of us call it a Sabbath or a sabbatical, isn't it? We say we need a sabbatical. Did we ever ask God? Anyway, that's a side note. How's that? There were those who would say, and the people of Israel, Jezebel, Ahab might have said when rain was withheld is that their God Baal had subjected himself to death. In other words, for a time and a period Baal had said allow death to reign. And that could be the reason many didn't repent in the time that God gave them including Ahab and Jezebel. You understand what I'm saying to you there is that that God declared that this would happen and like you and I, we find many reasons in life why things happen. We can explain away things quite easily with our own reasoning. And these people reasoned or whatever doesn't say, but why would people not repent? If God said, I'm going to withhold something from you for you for a time for you to repent and God withholds it, but you don't repent in that time. What is it that stopped you from repenting? Simply because our minds can reason away why we go through great difficulties. So what does God do? He sends his servant back to Ahab in the third year. And he says to Ahab, well basically it's a matter of you haven't repented so God is now going to do something else. You've maybe reasoned away that your God has subjected himself to death to allow death to take its course. And you're simply waiting for rain but now God will challenge your God who is also the God of fire and of life. And so we understand that he challenges him and the the prophets of Baal and they come to the Mount of Carmel and and we know the story that that they cut themselves. Why? Because that's what their God is said to have done uh, when the son and his son died and the son was revived again, Baal. And so this is the practice that they practice. And we understand and know that Elijah poured water on the offering and the sacrifice and God consumed it to show them that he is God. And only then did God's people fall on their knees and proclaim him Lord and God.
Have you ever thought, because we don't see any repentance from Ahab or Jezebel? None at all. In fact, if you were to read on chapter 19, you find Jezebel threatening Elijah and Elijah flees. And I'm not getting into that this section of the scripture. So often we can condition ourselves when we're going through difficult circumstances without seeing what God wants us to see. Because we simply manage our life through the circumstance. I'll make it a little clearer for you just now. The way I see it is that Ahab just allowed his life to slip by. Because he never expected to God to show up. Because he was worshipping another God. And the reason why we often just allow life to slip by, and when I mean slip by, when I'm saying life slips by, it means that we're not being productive, we're not being fertile, we're not being, um, we're not, God's not able to use us in the place that he wants to use us. That's lo allowing life to slip by. We, we look, there's another year gone, 2022 is gone, it's finished. Look back on 2022 and, and think about what changed, what, what happened in your life that you made a difference in other people's lives. Not because somebody made you, but because God spoke to you and showed you something for you to see. And for many of us, we, we look at 2022 and we say, well, there's not much there that happened other than the normal activity in life. And, and this is what Ahab did with his life. Ahab worshipped another God, never to understand that God would show up if he offered himself. And he said, Lord, here I am. Use me. See, his life was about pleasing people. And I can only think because if I looked at his wife and if I look at what little we have of her in the Bible, I could see who wore the pants in the palace. And so Ahab was a person who pleased people. And in his pleasing people, God never showed up. Many of us are people pleasers. And as long as we are people pleasers, God cannot show up. Because people will always be more important than the truth of God. And I'm not saying reading your Bible, but I'm, what I'm saying is that when God speaks to us, our first concern is how will people react? Elijah, I don't believe ever, I don't even think it dawned upon him. Lord, what will, what's Ahab going to say about this? When God spoke to him, he went. He says when, when he said, go to him and tell him there will be no rain for a number of years, he went and he spoke. He knew his life would be in danger. Ahab searched for him. And in chapter 18, when it says, okay, go back to Ahab and tell him, gather your people. He must have thought, Lord, <laughs> you've made this guy number one enemy. In fact, there's a wanted poster with my face on it at every town in this, in this uh, country. And every person knows that this is the man most wanted in this country and there must probably be a, a, a bounty on my head. And God says, go and tell him. And what does he do? He goes and he tells him. <clears throat> I want to ask you this morning, what do you think it is that God wants us to address in our society today as his church and as individuals who believe in an almighty God? You see, if we believe in an almighty God, he therefore is God supreme over everything. 
And if He then wants us to address things in our lives and in the lives of people around us, surely we need to hear what He has to say. And I want to ask you a few more questions. What do you, what, <clears throat> what makes you think that God will show up for you? Is it the wonderful prayers and the words that you speak? And sometimes we think through the eloquence of our speech and our prayers, and if, and if we could say our prayers in a certain way, it might move God and manipulate God to do the things that we want. I wonder, do you think that God would move? Do you think that you would hear just simply because you are faithful? In other words, if you're attending church and, and doing some things that God wants you to do. And you read your Bible and you, you prayed your eloquent prayers and your words. <clears throat> See, for Elijah, it was more about doing what he heard. And I wonder if we heard a simple word from God, and that simple word was go. How many of us would get up to move from our chairs waiting for the next word from God? I don't believe many. Because many and most of us want the full plan so that we can assess it and say, okay God, I agree with that plan. It doesn't affect my life too much. It doesn't affect my thinking and it doesn't affect, affect my beliefs. So Lord, let's implement the plan because it's okay. I wonder how many of us, when God said, go speak to Ahab the second time, would have got up and said, okay, Lord, no problem. I understand your plan. I know, your, I, I know what you've got in mind and I know exactly what's going to happen. I don't believe Elijah just trusted God simply. And I don't see the Bible telling us. In fact, when he sent his servant to go see the clouds, it says that he put his head between his knees. Now, I can't quite, can't quite work it out how he did that. If he was kneeling, then he must have been. But anyway, he sat, I believe, and put his head. He was praying. What was he praying? Or was he just sitting? Was he asking God? You, you, you see, when I look at Elijah's faith, I see a man, when God said, when he goes to Ahab and he says, I hear the sound of a gushing rain, or a rushing rain. That's where his, that's where, those were his words, isn't it? <clears throat> Let me read it for you. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. He hadn't even seen the cloud yet. He hadn't even sent his servant to look to see if there was a cloud. And yet he tells Ahab, I hear the sound of a rushing rain. It made me think, what was the reason that he sent the servant seven times to check if he already believed rain was coming? Do you remember another great prophet of the Bible in two kings? Elisha, sitting surrounded by the enemy, or the enemies in front of him. And it's a scripture that I absolutely love because it just shows how we as God's people cannot see. That our eyes are blind by the things that happen around us. And Elisha says, his servant says something that's about, are, are you not worried? Listen, it's, it's sort of like we would be. Uh, are you not worried about the circumstance? Are you not worried about this position? Are you not worried about what's going on? And Elisha simply says, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. 
and surrounding them were the angels of God, the army of God. And Elisha had no worries. Why? Because he could see what God wanted him to see in the situation. He had no worries simply. The same as Elijah. And we understand that Elisha got a double portion of what Elijah had. And it wasn't eloquent prayers. It wasn't uh, getting on his, falling on his face and, and praying and, and, and saying, Oh Lord, no. It was an attitude of faithfulness and confidence in God that he could see what God wanted him to see. And when he prayed, he said, Lord, just open his eyes. God opened the eyes of the servant. You know, when Elijah hears, or he says to, um, his, his confidence in God, that God had sent him, that he knew it was God that had sent him. His confidence was such that he told Ahab, I hear the rushing rain. Go up and eat. What do we do when we eat? We celebrate, don't we? I looked through some commentaries, and there's not one commentary that mentioned anything about celebration. But in my spirit, like the Lord spoke to me, that Elijah was telling Ahab, go celebrate the coming rain. Go eat and drink. One commentary said, yeah, well, Ahab should, couldn't have eaten for the whole morning. So Elijah was worried about his tummy and sent him to go and eat something before he... I, I shook my head because in my spirit the Lord just spoke to me and said, you know, what do we do as good full gospelers? We celebrate with food, don't we? Yes. Hmm? And Elijah sending him off to go eat and drink, he's telling him, Ahab, listen, God has spoken. And when God speaks, it will happen. So go and celebrate. Why? Because it's coming now. And if you don't celebrate now, you're going to get drowned out by the rain that's coming. How's that for something? Added to the commentary. Hmm? <clears throat> and what I want us to see this morning is that Elijah, sorry, Elijah, he understood the responsibility that fell upon him. He understood the responsibility that God had placed upon his shoulders. The responsibility to make sure that people around him, especially God's people, the chosen people, those who were rebellious and unrepentant, God wanted them to be reminded that he is the God of heaven and earth. And he wanted them to understand that he still loved them. And Elijah understood the responsibility he had that he needed to show people what God had shown him. What he understood about God, God wanted that related to the people around him. And his responsibility was to go to preach. To tell them that this God, whom they have neglected, whom they have pushed aside, whom they have put a second in their lives, or third or fourth in their lives, that this is the supreme God. And he wants them back. See, he wanted them to understand <clears throat> what, what he wants us to understand as well. He wanted Elijah to show them that they needed to depend upon him. But they needed to see it. That their hope was in Him alone. And in Elijah's message to Ahab was You are the anointed, you are the appointed. You are the most powerful being in the kingdom of Israel. And yet you cannot see what God has shown me. And Elijah took the responsibility that God had given him.
to make sure the people understood the message. See, so often we think our prayers, and there's questions I asked you about our eloquent prayers, and that we think our prayers will move God. But it takes faithfulness, commitment, and responsibility. In other words, I need to step up when I hear the word go and begin to go. And in faithfulness, God will be faithful. See, Elijah had to be obedient. Remember when Naaman wanted to be cleansed, a leper, a Syrian commander, and he went to Elisha? And I was thinking about this story when I was preparing this and thinking about how we are as Christians. And somebody was telling me, I, I visited somebody this week, and they were saying to me, uh, they don't go to the prayer meeting, this is their prayer this is their kingdom or their, in their home. And this is where they pray. And I thought, well, how do we become part of the body? And that story of Naaman and Elisha, where Elisha didn't even get out of his house, he just sent his servant. You go deal with the guy. Often, that's our attitude towards God's work, God's kingdom. Lord, I'll do so much. Send someone else to do the rest. Lord, I'll pray here, but it's too much to ask me to go over there. It's too much to ask me to be with God's people when you need me there. You know, sometimes God needs you in a certain place that your eyes or your spiritual eyes can reveal to others what God has shown you. Elijah was that. To reveal to a people who are lost what God had spoken. We need to become more excited about interaction with God instead of fearful. We need to become excited about what God is going to do in our lives and in the lives of others. <clears throat> and Elijah spoke to the people just before he called down fire from heaven. In 18 verse 21 he says, And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Why? Because they were still in two minds. We are often in two minds because we have little inspiration, we have little hope, and we lack spiritual insight. Sheep to the slaughter. And as disciples, we need to learn to take the responsibility for the word and the instruction of the word. <clears throat> there are people around us that are in the same drought. There is nothing fertile in their lives. Okay, let me revise that because some of them have many children. We're not talking about children now, okay. Spiritually fertile, there is nothing in their lives. And I want to tell you why. Go to your WhatsApps, your Facebooks. Go to your Twitter, your Instagram. I don't know what else there is, or I don't have any of those things, except WhatsApp. Go to your local groups for security. Go to your church groups if you want. Go to your electricity groups, and all you find is people complaining. You ever thought about that? This country has become a people who complain and gripe about everything. Paul never had electricity. Do you see him complaining about it? Do you ever see anything in the Bible about ESCOM? I'm just joking. <laughs> I 
we read the stories of the great men of the Bible. We do not find them. Yes, we do. Elisha in the next chapter complaining to God. But God dealt with him. He stood up and he moved on. We don't see them staying in depression, complaining constantly. Don't you think, as children of God, that we need to get over this and get on with the things that God has spoken about? Put aside the complaining and the complaints about load shedding and water problems and political issues and get on with the Christian duties and responsibilities that God has assigned us through His Word. Elijah believed that God would act as he said. What has God, what is he saying to us in his word? <clears throat> See, if we would speak more of God's promises, there would be more hope. God never promised you a fancy house. He never promised you 24 hours of escort. He never promised you water on tap. He promised you salvation. He promised you eternal life. And He promised that to anyone who believes in Him. See, I believe Elijah sent his servant back seven times. Why? Because the servant needed to believe. Elijah already believed. He knew what God was going to do. And I wonder if it was in the same context and the same thought around what Elisha did to his servant, Lord, open his eyes, that he sent the servant back seven times. Do you think the cloud would have come any quicker? No. Because things happen according to the will of God. Things happen because of the faithfulness of God. Because of the right timing of the Lord. And that's not an excuse for you and I to sit back and say, Oh well, let fate have its course. Because God wants faithful people who will move His hand at the right time according to His will. You know, and I wondered, and asked you and I said, Do you think God will show up? Well, let me tell you something. God showed up even though he knew Elijah would run for his life. See, God showing up doesn't depend upon the words that I speak and the eloquent prayers that I have. It doesn't depend upon who I am and my character, but it depends upon God and his character. It depends upon God's faithfulness. What God has proclaimed will happen. The question, will we be a part of it? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. You see, God's plan, God's will continues no matter what. But will we be a part of what God has said? And you know that God, Mr. Obley, He planned that this word would be spoken to you today. Why? Because you needed to hear it. Why? Because you needed to decide, like the people in Elijah's time under Ahab, how long will you continue in two minds? How long will you continue procrastinating whether you will serve God or you will serve the world? You know, we have, I think it's 350 days left of this year. Now we can look at them and say, it's 350 days of, of only half a day in power. I mean, to Eskom power, I'm talking about. We can look at them and say, well, it's 350 days of, of difficulties and I'm, I'm going to have to do this. Or we can look at it and say, well, we have 350 days, opportunities to express the love and the kindness and the generosity and the goodness of God. We have 350 days to spread the word to a people who are lost. We have 350 days to do something different, better than we did in 2022. Not because I make a New Year's resolution. Because I'm becoming excited for the Word of God. I'm being excited because God's Spirit dwells within me. 
You see, there's nothing more exciting than knowing who dwells in you and that he's got a plan for the future. That he's got not only a plan for tomorrow, but he has a plan for this afternoon. And most of us, our plan is we're going to go home and eat and sleep and watch TV. But what's God's plan? What's God's plan for this afternoon for you? And what's his plan for tomorrow? I want to encourage you. Allow God's will to come forth. Why? Because we see God's plan. Why? Because I bend my knees before him and I ask him, Lord, show me. Lord, send me. Lord, use me. Lord, I'll take this responsibility on and I know it's going to be difficult, but Lord, I take this responsibility. Why? Because you are God. And because I worship you. And because I love you, because you loved me before the beginning of time. Because you knew me in my mother's womb, before I was even born. And you still loved me. I want to encourage you. Let's make the next 350 days, that's including today. Godly days. And I don't mean just in attendance, but I mean asking God to show you what's His plan. And listen, you falter today, but don't go home with the attitude. You know, and I've said this many times, we, we are people who procrastinate. When we die, we're starting tomorrow. Always. I want to exercise. We'll start next week. Next week never comes, because when you're in today, it's next week, or tomorrow. And we always make these plans, and we say these things, and we, we commit ourselves, and we say, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Well, if it's only going to happen tomorrow or next week, it means it's not going to happen. Why? Because there's no commitment. Make a commitment. Take on responsibility. Do what God has called you to. Make the next 350 days count. This year is the year in this church that we want to make disciples. Let's become disciples so we can make disciples. We can only become disciples when we hear the word of God, when we hear the voice of God. And I'm not saying an audible voice. I'm not saying you've got to hear God speak to you in the sun. No. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his spirit. He speaks to us from the pulpit. He speaks to us from our friends. He speaks to us from our family. And we know when the Spirit is speaking. But so often we just neglect and avoid.